Hello, hello. Uh, I don't know how I am bringing. Yo, yo. Hey, Max, you're on. Hey, I was just telling you I was in the background. <laughs> <laughs> I was backstage. Don't need to send that chat now. What's up, Oren? Not much. What's going on, Davin? <laughs> hello, Max. I'm I'm in my sister's master bedroom in Washington, D.C. Yeah, I, 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 I mentioned that I was online, but I don't think anybody noticed. So the, the uh, so uh, I decided to go to work on the fence. But So what you guys got going on? Well, um, I put out that question the other day. Um, what is it that we want help from in a community whenever it is that we're fully sustainable? Well, my opinion is, is that, um, uh, once you're sustainable, then you can do cool things. And it's not that necessarily that you need help. You can make trade amongst communities, which is a good thing is what, and I think it should happen. But the main concern would be, in my opinion, is like, what cool things can you actually do? Cool things like, how can you replace cement? Can you really get rubber off of your property via the plants that you've chosen? Um, what is the best ge uh, uh, geometric shape that will give you the best throughput on various types of uh, passive convection? You know, um, how can you take uh, humid air using passive methods and remove that humidity from the air in a very efficient way? Collect the water and then cool or heat that air. Uh, in, uh, in Texas, of course, you know, Davin, then Houston is pretty humid. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's a problem for the southern states. Not such a problem up here, but it's a problem. So... That's not really a need in my mind. That's a, but in, um, I guess in your basic needs, I guess a, a self actualization, a, a self actualization that's necessary. Hey, Rogue, you got a little bit of background noise, but welcome. Hey, thank <laughs> Yeah, my laptop's fan is going crazy. It's so excited for this live stream. <laughs> Hello, Rogue. I'm Warren. Hey, Warren. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. My niece wanted to join in on this live stream, and it took a lot to uh, get her out of the room. So I I'm really that. happy. <laughs> um, so anybody want to respond to Warren? That's that's a lot of uh, a lot of ideas he just threw out to oh, it's not the process idea. at once. It's, it's not the ideas. It's the fact that we should be doing better things than just self-sustaining. And I threw those ideas out as examples, as metaphors, not as specific things to respond to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I hear better things than self-sustaining, I'm thinking hex, right? Financially, is that self-sustainment as far as financial things that are better or just a community better I, I missed the first part of the discussion too so i should probably not so, so the the question as i understand it is once you reach a level of self-sufficiency with you know the base needs right like food water electricity power those things then what is it that you want from your intentional community above the basic needs? Is that the, the right question? I think so. And so, and so um, Warren was saying uh, that now that you've got the, the basics covered, you can go into the next level, which is really cool stuff. Like what can you achieve as a community? Is, is that right, Warren? Yes. And basically, I guess more specifically, it's what kind, what can we do to shift the technology to technology that is uh, non-destructive and uh, yet is still um, 
it performs as well as the other technology that is out there currently that's doing damage to our ecosystems. Hmm. Yeah, I look at um, how we function in an existing way right now, and it's really hard to see new avenues, um, like like the new webbing. Uh, it's hard to see it before we're we're put in the instance to where it just makes sense. So what do you guys think about um, uh, the idea of technology, a uh, rogue and Max, uh, of creating technology that actually allows other people to change or move away from the current technology we have? Is, is that something you guys are actually interested in or is that like, what the hell is he talking about? No, I, I think uh, a lot of people will do uh, what's the easiest you know, the path of least resistance, unless you make it that much better for them to change their behaviors. So like you were saying, if you can really create a way that's really going to draw people into changing their behaviors, uh, then I think that's awesome. Uh, I just, I think a lot of people are really slow to change unless they have to, uh, unless they're already of this mindset where they are trying to uh, live intentionally and build a community where, you know, they're, they are actually addressing problems with society, with the environment. I agree with you. I, I think though we're at the point now where there's a lot of displaced people and there's going to continue to be more displaced people as things can turn, continue to burn down around us and continue to get destroyed by high powered winds. You know, that's my opinion. And so there'll be no other choice. There'll be no other option for them. Right, right. So you're saying that the, the pain of saying the same is going to be greater than the pain of changing for a lot of people coming up. That's my belief, and I might be mistaken. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, technology, it's interesting as we chat about technology and what do we want to determine which technology should we do because that's technology is different depending on the age you're in our ancestors had technology a wheel or whatever uh, odometer made out of wood these are these were technologies and so if we say what technology do we want to have to improve a community or to improve life and that's it sounds like that's the question is are we over technologing things with electronics, the EMFs, uh, electricity, as far as where we're g gathering it. And then do we, what, what is a uh, good amount, a uh, correct amount of technology to introduce into a community? Uh, and then there's also, how do we bring in like-minded people into a community? I, I found that with community, there's always opinionated people and you're going to be very strong and and stubborn in that opinion in that in your ideas to say here's how i think it should be and work with other opinions within a community so technology is just one of those concepts or topics that a community with strong opinions are going to have but if Oren is saying that we once we uh get to a point where it's so painful that we need to look at these alternatives, these other things with technology or whatever it may be. I, I think that's pretty clear that that's something we would have to switch over to either wind generation or whatever it was you were talking about, solar generation or water, hydro, whatever the technology is that we feel like this is the data drives us to this type of technology that we want to do as a community. Well, let's let's actually just do a thought experiment. Let's flesh one of these out. Let's say, for instance, uh, the way that that uh, most people deal with their waste or their trash is they put it out on the curb, and someone takes it away and buries it in the dirt, hoping that eventually Mother Nature will 
decompose of it by the time it becomes too much of a problem. And then, of course, a lot of it, as we know, ends up in, in the oceans. A lot of plastic and, and junk goes into the oceans. So just just uh, maybe that's one place we could just start out and say, uh, I know up there in Wheaton Labs, uh, you guys are very um, judicious about how you guys uh, dispose of, of different materials. And welcome, Hex Dragon. Good to see you, bud. Your audio is a little uh, rough, I might say. Hex is that Dragon. my audio or is that a Hex Dragon's audio? I think, I think it's Dragon's. Dragon's. Yeah. Okay. Hex Dragon. Hex Dragon is joining us from a different planet, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of technology. Yeah. <laughs> So, like I said, let's just flesh out one thing, like like waste disposal, or 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 if you guys have another example, we could flesh that out and say, what would that look like as a community versus uh, just the conventional way that we, you know, uh, procrastinate our problems. Well, if, um, the waste generation is a difficult problem because all of our if a person tries to make a transition from one state to another, you're still going to have to use a little bit of the previous state in order to finish getting to the current state. And so um, it would be nice to have a containerless um, or a, a, a swappable container um, solution for because that's where most of our waste is coming from is everything is packaged, is packaging. So, and it's, that's not 100% true, but in general, that is true. And so, the, you know, maybe instead of allowing waste into a community, you come up with ways that whatever, let's say you're not sustainable yet, then how do you get food in without a ton of packaging going out? So that would be one solution. Another solution would be, um, okay, you've got the plastic rather than getting rid of it. Can you use fungi? Can you use bacteria? Can you use um, different kind of creatures that actually like to eat certain types of plastics and uh, get rid of large volumes of plastic? I don't know if there's an answer. You know, I don't know what the answer to that is. Um, I've never seen anybody try it. I just know that such things exist. I know there's bacteria, fungi, and a couple of wasps that will eat plastics, but how much? You know how quickly I don't know I like the idea of people recognizing the human pace of things um, so you know how do people do away with their um, their waste that comes out of their body and uh, also travel um, actually people recognizing what it takes to, to travel uh, a certain portion of land and uh, maybe <clears throat> their understanding of skill scale uh, could come back to home. And so like at the same time that we're talking about cryptocurrencies connecting people at great distances, um, somehow have this respect of the locale I'm uh, sorry to Hex Dragon for his difficulties of getting his mic going. I ha I had to keep uh, muting him every time I tried. Right, he's he's probably just sitting outside of a McDonald's trying to jump on their Wi-Fi. It's, I'm not sure where he's getting his Wi-Fi from, but he's got some really interesting thoughts. I I know he's spent a lot of time uh, researching and thinking about these different. Uh, dynamics of intentional community. So hopefully he can get back on and share with us. But uh, as Oren was saying, uh, there are some um, solutions that not many people have tried on scale. And so that would be something that you could do as an intentional community is get a group of a hundred to a thousand people together and try to actually implement some of these things of, of uh, using the same containers over and over to cut down on packaging within the community or setting up one of these places and seeing how much plastic and, and other material you can get to actually 
be recycled uh, on the on spot on 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 location. I like the idea of doing it on location because we no longer know what's really happening with our recycled waste. You know, I know a guy. I've heard stories, and I don't want to spread them because then it'll stop people from recycling. But I've heard stories that be, uh, I'm beginning to suspect some of that recycling isn't being done. Um, Warehouse, uh, WN, <coughs> um, those guys, it's not Warehouser. It's uh, those guys, waste management uh, people, have, their behavior seems to be questionable from the things that I'm hearing from the people that work for them. So, uh, yeah, I would really like to see it done on location. So then that way... I mean, if we find something that works, glass, plastic, whatever, and it actually is works to the point where not only does it cure the waste problem, but it also produces a raw material that's valuable to the outside community, not just to us, then that's that would be awesome. So what about uh, using clay and just recycling clay over and over? So, uh, again, back to the technology, um, I, I think that clay has its uses, and there's nothing wrong with clay. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, given, you know, the technology that the current culture has already discovered. Um, and so, I mean, I'm not a big fan of using plastics, because I know when oil is finally depleted, then... <laughs> Uh, plastic's going to have a, uh, there's going to be a problem with trying to make things out of plastic. But, so if you try to use clay again and again and again, you can do it. Um, a clay can become burnt if you're not careful. And I don't know what would happen if you use clay past a certain time, if it would become uh, like the burnt clay that's been exposed to like soup, higher heats than is normally required to, uh, you know, set it make it a piece of ceramic um, so I'd, I'm not sure what the end usability of clay would be like a clay pot the other issue is like you want everything to be breakable you know like in some factories they won't allow glass bottles because if you break a glass bottle and it's in the food now you have a problem you know and if it's a food factory or if it's uh, you know so and that's why I'm talking about not throwing away all the technology that we already know about and just going solely to, um, I don't want to become a Luddite. Let's put it that way. I'm not interested in becoming a Luddite. Yes. We, we hear your voice. All right. Sorry about the technical difficulties. <laughs> So, uh, y'all sounded like aliens talking about human excrement. Am I correct? <laughs> yeah, I'm well, sure. to, yeah, waste, waste, baby. All right. Well, uh, so specifically, uh, Oren was talking about um, plastic, uh, dealing with that issue on site. Sure. So. Um, I have a little bit of background in this, actually. Uh, material science, packaging, um, and waste slash resource streams. And um, what I usually like to do is create the context that all waste is actually just an underused or unused and oftentimes abundant resource. Um, so plastic is an amazing material that we've created an abundance of, and we have an incomplete um, recycling a reuse stream, and that's resulted in uh, some uh, natural systems collapse. And um, it really is a free material that is quite valuable that can be used. Um, I have a friend who's actually building houses out of it because they have so much plastic. Um, it is easy to recycle, um, not all of it, uh, but a lot of types are. And um, it really should be viewed as a valuable resource. Um, so one of the things that is beneficial for living by a city, for example, is there's all these waste streams that are essentially free to us. Um, for example, 
uh, when I lived by Arcosanti, there was a recycling center and they would sell a ton of aluminum for uh, 20 to $50. So you'd have to recycle it yourself. But if you look at how much raw aluminum is, it's like hundreds or thousands of dollars in material. So um, connecting, just recognizing that we don't have real waste, it's just misuse. And if we can change that mindset, uh, we can create real abundance for our communities very quickly and potentially lots of uh, income, uh, economic uh, generation. And that's what I kind of suggested. If we found a way to handle some of the waste stream, we might end up with a raw material that's valuable to the outside community, not just to ourselves. I think we share some common ideas the the one that i'm a little hesitant about is like so the problem with some plastics is they will break down uh very quickly and even the ones that break down slowly you, you end up with microfibers and those microfibers i've seen um i asked this one a woman to take me and show me her favorite hangout place as a kid and so she took me to this little lagoon off the coast of New York and I looked down at the beach and on the beach she didn't notice it because she was remembering childhood instead of like seeing what was there and then I started pointing out all these little pieces of plastic that were like you know maybe a sixteenth an eighth all over the beach you know in the rocks all over and it's like she's like whoa won't you and then you know it was like it I shouldn't have done that, you know what I mean, <laughs> for her favorite spot. But I'm, I also noticed it for myself because I'd never seen a place with so many microplastics in it. So there are some materials that there's a lot of we can use, but then at the end of their life cycle, rather than waiting until they become a, a problem, then we can do something with it. And I know there's fungi and there's bacteria that will eat them if we choose to go that way yeah many of that can be broken down naturally i think that we're going to see um as we're seeing right now with basically this like ecology reset um we've devastated most of the planet there's new uh, organisms that are becoming uh very dominant very successful uh, alongside humans and i think we'll start to see some of the fungi and bacteria do that um thermoplastics are very challenging uh, in general to deal with uh, but one of the things that's really cool that, um, if we look at our fossil records is we have all these layers of sediment and stuff and different things that are happening throughout history. And we're gonna have a plastic layer. Um, <laughs> it's just a fact like, but nature's going to grow on top of it. If you, uh, one of the things that is really inspiring for me, and I used to give a tour, uh, at the farm I was just at for this is, um, you're there and it's just like a building and then grass everywhere. And what people, as soon as you have a shovel, give, some, give someone a shovel, uh, depending on where you are between um, a centimeter to a few inches um, is bricks. And this entire field was actually a large patio outdoor restaurant space. And it was just 20 years ago. And it's you wouldn't even know it. And um, this is one of the things that's really interesting with like, our, our ecology, not our ecology, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, basically, the study of like past civilizations and stuff. Anyway, um, archaeology. 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 Thank you. I love the concept of archaeology, but that's not the same as archaeology. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, we're discovering like ancient cities and ancient road systems and these amazing systems that are just buried under the earth. And they're not that old, they're only hundreds of years or thousands of years old. So, Yes, what's happening right now is kind of devastating, but I think that with regeneration, we are going to kind of just do what nature does and it covers it up, it covers up the damage of the past. And we kind of forget about it um, and we shouldn't forget about it, but we can see past civilizations that have failed and they've been covered up by nature uh, when that rewilding happens. So even if we don't have a solution for it, moving forward in a regenerative fashion will allow the earth to cover up our past mistakes. Um, my, I am, 
I agree with what you're saying about what you see in past archaeology. I disagree somewhat in this fashion with uh, the rest of what you've just said. Never before have there been this many people contributing to that kind of devastation to our planet, not just in the materials that we create, but in the number of life forms that we are devastating. So if the Earth does manage to live through this and does cover us up and we just ignore the problem, then what I think will happen is we'll have a planet full of insects and bacteria and viruses and nothing else. I don't want a planet like that. Well, I'm not suggesting ignoring the problem. What I'm saying is that we, nature already has a solution in place. And I simply pointed out what that was. I'm definitely not advocating for us to continue being a detriment to the planet. I'm, I'm pro humans remembering that we are stewards of earth and it's all of our responsibility to caretake this planet and to uh, move forward intelligently and consciously. Um, but uh, yeah, that's all I'm saying. Okay, and so I guess uh, a less a less strong tone from what I'm suggesting is I think we're past the point in which the planet can simply regenerate by herself this time. That's what I'm suggesting. And I might be wrong. Um, I mean, it depends on the time frame you're looking at. So, yes, <laughs> like if we look at like we had a meteor impact this planet and it devastated basically all surface life. All of it, and uh, and much of the oceanic life, and we recovered, but it took a very long time. So, one thing I have to tell people is, um, like right now, what's what's wrong? We we've desertified the planet. Uh, everywhere we look, there's deserts, and it's caused from how we've done agriculture or forestry. Now, if we leave nature alone, um, and there's already like some life there, uh, the Nature will restore the solar organic matter content at about a rate of 1% per century. It's kind of slow. We want it to like 4% where you start having like a stable ecosystem again. But if humans are involved and we do regenerative agriculture, we can restore about 1% per year, 100 times faster. And if you're in more extreme places like Sahara, you're looking at more like 1,000 years to restore 1%. So... It really depends on how fast we want to do stuff. Now, if we want to all survive and thrive, I think it's important that we um, start thinking abundantly. We start thinking regeneratively and cooperatively for how we can start reversing the desertification that's happening around us. And um, yeah, that's what my passion is, is, is shifting us from this consumption to this uh, scarcity mindset into we want to have abundance and things that we can do that are within our means. And uh, I think that hexagons are... Uh, potentially this catalyst because we are all at becoming um, wealthy and abundant and that can open you up to a mindset mind shift and what abundance really is and what really matters because all the money in the world doesn't make this planet survive um, it it doesn't like it doesn't matter how much money you have if we're not working towards regeneration so I love that Richard wants to focus on human longevity. And I think that's a part of the solution because when people realize they're living longer, they need to start caring about stuff. So if you if you know you can live to 600 years old, you're like, well, shit, this 50 year timeline that we're looking at for climate change, um, ending human life actually matters to me now because I'm still gonna be alive in 50 years. Uh, so it appear, appeals to those who are very selfish um, and I would say that the boomer generation is is at that, that point where they're the kind of who we can talk about is where they don't really care, be, a lot of them, because they don't feel like they're going to get to enjoy the benefits of the work. So if, and that will be true of whichever generation comes after, as we get close to that point, people are like, I've already put in my work, my time. But when we realize that now we have 10 times as long to live and we do get to see a tree grow to maturity, we start thinking longer term, delaying the gratification of not buying the house that's all pretty and stuff, but rather growing the materials to build that perfect home and to plant that food forest that'll take care of us for centuries. Cool. So what kind of, uh, what, out of curiosity, what uh, thing would you guys focus on? I brought up plastics. What, uh, what kind of things would you guys focus on 
other than the packaging and the plastics of uh, whatever we bring into the uh, community. Wait, before you guys answer that, could you give me a, a clear question how, in the context for what this discussion is? I want to be able to stay on track and follow everybody else. You're muted, David. It might be nice also to go back and talk about some of our experiences or some of the things that we're coming from, from communities or yeah. what our past experiences are. So I posted this on a Facebook group that's uh, Hex Foodies. And I said, uh, what help from community will you want once you are sustainable with your homestead? And the reason we got all the way down to uh, plastics is because I suggested that once you become su um, sustainable, then then we can start to do real things that are important, like address new technologies that will be useful um, for us in the outside world. And then um, Max said, "Well, let's look at what you know, like the idea of plastics. What 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 can we do about that? You know, what and what how we." would we handle those on site and you know using uh our free time now that we have a sustainable system uh to address technological problems so that's where that conversation went if you want to take an answer to that question a completely different ways i'm perfectly comfortable with that i think also hearing people's idea of what sustainable is um, because I think a lot of times, as soon as you reach it, what's just becoming sustainable, a lot of these problems go away. Because right now we are in a system that encourages scarcity, builds on scarcity, perpetuates scarcity, which is waste and all that. But if you're in a sustainable system, you're not producing those things anyway. So it becomes a not a present problem, but rather a cleanup of the past, which is very important still. And I agree with that fully, everything you're saying. That's actually why I got into packaging. Uh, was because I saw plastic as a problem. I wanted to better understand how we could solve it. I think that's a good point that that whole question of what help from community would you need once your sustainable changes, once you actually become sustainable. If the discussion is, is how do we get to sustainability or what are the problems with the current system right now that's not sustainable? My, my, answer to that from the community would be different. And then I would jump into what are the talents that I have that I offer to the community in a sustainable community once we are sustainable, that I would say, here's what I can offer and here's the talents and the skills that I don't have that I would want from the community. Maybe raising cattle or butchering, things like that would be uh, skills that I would need to learn or that some other person in the community could offer. Uh, Hex Dragon, were you wanting to discuss what we all thought sustainability meant? Yeah, I would, I'd be curious to hear from each of your perspectives what, um, how you will achieve or cons what uh, your definition is of sustainability. So you know when you've reached it and maybe include how Hex is going to uh, contribute to that. I think that uh, sustainability is as close to a closed loop system as you can achieve. You know, uh, I was doing some commentary for the video we're putting out when uh, we went out and visited the OSR. And the thing that we noticed uh, a lack of out of the OSR was calories. You know, the amount of calories being produced in that sustainable or intentional community was, was far below what, what they'll need in the future. And on top of that, um, when it came to taking care of uh, animals, which is a great source of calories, um, they, you know, everyone right now is dependent upon, um, you know, hardware stores, Cal Ranch, IFA, those kind of big farm stores to get their feed, to get their pet supplies. And I thought, do you really want to close off that loop and the calorie loop and the food loop as much as possible? 
Um, that seems to be the hardest loop for for us to close in this society is the calorie loop. It's trying to get enough calories to feed everybody in a community. And so, like I said, that the, the loop is where I would gauge someone's uh, self-reliance. I think that's a good definition of sustainable. I would define for myself sustainable as having uh, food, energy, shelter, water, um, minimally, uh, and knowing that the land I'm on um, is secure uh, from all obvious uh, tyrannical takeover, whatever, such as landlords, being sold out from under you or whatever um so yeah i would say owning the land and then um and i guess to give a vision for how community work um and what i'm working towards is um one people having a, a small private homestead uh this is for america um and i i say my answer is different for americans than it is globally because americans are conditioned to be very individualistic so when it comes to creating community, I found that for us to be most successful, uh, we want to build a bridge, not an island. Um, with, and then, uh, and the, so I want the bridge to be something that people can feel comfortable stepping onto from where they're at and gradually journey towards maybe more idealistic communities in the future. Um, and not something that's so far away that people who don't know how to swim or whatever just will be afraid to even try going to the island. Um, so uh having a homestead for people to produce um some of their own fruit and vegetables but a community space uh like or rather a farm um a regenerative agricultural farm so focused on perennials not annuals uh to produce abundance with intent uh intensive animal grazing moving through it to produce that food and uh wood resource abundance uh and fuel abundance so I do think that um, there are plenty of technologies that have, are very sound. They've been around for up to 200 years, um, including like paralysis. Uh, I think that's how you say it. Um, not paralysis. Uh, uh, the technique where basically you make biochar. Um, you burn it part way, but not all the way. So it generates a lot of heat, but also creates a, a fuel product. Anyway, you can collect that heat for energy generation. Um, and yeah, I believe those are called uh, wood gasifier systems. Yes, and the the actual burning process, such as the P, I don't know what that's called. But yes, gasification is part of it. Um, anyway, it's how we create our own fuel, create our own energy, um, create our own food, and our own building materials. So for me, uh, I'm not targeting sustainability, but rather targeting regeneration, so that I can continue the. Uh, be in abundance and comfortable. Um, and yeah, with the food forest, we're producing food abundance that way. Uh, it is both very hard and easy to achieve. Um, typically, right now with how we grow our food, it takes about five acres per person to feed them. But with a more efficient system, you can feed people on about half an acre or less. Um, so yeah, I, to reiterate, safety, Food, resources, shelter, water, energy. Yeah, I'd only want to buy uh, something like mechanism wise once. And so that's after I had those base uh, life essentials, then I would think about uh, sort of sustainability being that. Um, I only have to make these large purchases once and continue to go further um, with my resources. That was the one thing I forgot. Um, the community benefit is acquiring the means of production. So are you all familiar with maker spaces? Yes. So there was an excellent one in Austin, which was called the tech shop. It was all high end equipment, but basically a community having a makerspace, I think is essential because you can build your tools, you can use them. 
They're high precision. You can repair your tools. You can fabricate whatever you need. So a community that has the means of production no longer has to rely on um, stores or other things. They can, but having uh, people acquire those skills to maintain and be innovative is really important. Also, um, as far as technology to run a regenerative farm, it really doesn't exist. Uh, that's highlighted in the book, Restoration Agriculture. Uh, most of our farming or agricultural technology is geared towards monocultures. And uh, when you have something more complex like a food forest, uh, those equipments are completely useless. So you either go back to having people harvest everything by hand or have to invent uh, new technologies. Um, so one opinion I have on that is growing food for yourself is pretty great, but in a food forest, but trying to use the food forest model to produce income to sell that surplus food outside be very labor intensive. I grant you you're in shade, but it's still not going to be uh, very enjoyable for many people. So I think that a community that tries to have an economy based on food production um, in food forests is going to be challenged. I kind of, as I was thinking about some of the ideas of sustainability, I also think in terms of self-sufficiency but when we bring in a whole new level of, are we bridging the community outside for either monetary or some kind of commerce that might, that changes the dynamics a little bit for me. Uh, if I define sustainable, sometimes I go to what is not sustainable and I look at past civilizations or, or other civilizations or other people that have done it kind of as, as you, you guys have been doing, uh, one thing I think about with the food, shelter, water, security, resources, how did, say, first world peoples or indigenous folks do that? And we can't, maybe we can't model everything, but it's there's some lessons to be learned from, from them. The idea of ownership of land was a little bit different, but they have a lot of great ideas on, on managing their waste or what they did with their commerce or what they did with their resources. Uh, the definition... Uh, to what it is not, I think of kind of the system and the dependencies as Hex Revision was talking about with the system now is what I see not sustainable. Uh, when I was a kid, my dad worked for uh, the Denver Post in Colorado and I went down and I checked out this huge building that was massive in this big urban uh, city area and it was a the media, the Denver Post was newspapers, media, and what else were the big, big buildings that were down in that city it was banking, uh, education, corporations, and government. The big, these big monopolies and these big industry things that said become dependent on us, and this monocropping idea or this idea of divvying out to those who they're in control, uh, based in a very small land area is what I don't see as sustainable. So that's what I don't see as sustainable. Uh, sustainability to me is the inputs and the outputs. Uh, and, that, and that's kind of how I would define it as I, I, I agree with everything that everyone's been saying here, with most of it. I'm so tempted to go down that rabbit hole you just mentioned, neurogerbalist, about the government, the media slash newspaper, and the banks. Like that really is how I think. And I don't want to go too deep here, but how um, you go from a uh, indigenous community into being taken over into modern society is like the banks come in, the propaganda comes in. Um, and, and now you have an entire society dependent on these fictitious organizations that really just leech resources and power and, um, and exploit, uh, the abundance that was there. So I, I do love the idea of modeling at least as a baseline, a re an indigenous solution, which is a lot of land producing way more food than they need. 
so much food that they don't worry about all the other animals and stuff that share that space with them. Um, so many resources that when they use the different trees, the different things, there's something else already replacing it. And they're actually beneficial because if you have too many trees, like you need to remove them to help steward the land you can use those resources. So I, I think context is really important in that if you are trying to be actually sustainable, you need a lot of land uh, to have a thriving ecosystem and to impact the weather around you and all that too. I don't feel a lot familiar with microclimates, but um, forests help produce rain. And the larger space you have, um, the more stable your climate can become again. And uh, so I think it's beautiful to look at that. And I think a lot of people who try homesteading, they do so on such a small piece of land, uh, it's very challenging. And, or really close to a city where it's really expensive. That's kind of where I'm navigating right now. I have a group of people doing a land buy and we want to be close to Austin, but Austin's property values are skyrocketing. So for us to have tens or hundreds or even thousands of acres of land, um, we need a lot of capital to do that. Or we can step out much further from isolationists where land's cheaper and uh, have land abundance, but we then lose the convenience of the city and the draw of the city and all the other wonderful things that cities do offer and um, are really hard to discount. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I can't, I can't help, help but make, make the, the, um, the parallel between uh, having enough land to sustain you and also having uh, the, the idea of a burn rate when it comes to retirement, you know? So when someone tries to retire, they need their um, investments to throw off enough interest that they'll never kill the golden goose, right? So they have these formulas of burn rate, which is like 4%. So they say, you know, if they're making good interest and you're eating up or spending 4% of your income, then it, your investment will hopefully outlive you. And I was thinking about that in terms of land, you know, you've got enough, enough calories, enough resources and, and energy in that land. So you can take, you can consume what you need to without ever catching up and causing harm to to the system. Is that right? I think that's well said. Um, now, what's interesting with that, and this comes right back to regeneration, is that unfortunately our ancestors have already burned through our resources. So we're looking at acquiring desert land or highly degraded land, or even farmland, which is basically highly degraded land. There are no resources on it. So we have to start from scratch. We need to plant our forests now so that we can enjoy them someday. So we need to in install systems that will generate abundance for us, produce these um, high interest returns, so to speak. Uh, because right now there aren't, we didn't, we didn't inherit anything that we can use, uh, that we can thrive in. Um, everything has been decimated. And uh, and not stewarded properly. We, there's there's some land that is owned in mass by either Bureau of Land Management or privately owned that still is out there, but it either becomes expensive or it's just not on the market. And so it sounds like. As maybe hex dragon, you're looking as you're looking, you're seeing what's left over the desert land or the farmland that's been decimated. And maybe hex gives us an opportunity to afford land that hasn't been so much decimated, but could be expensive. You could do that shortcut, and I you do have a, a decent point. I, I want to one point out BLM land, um, it's usually grazed by cattle, so it is also in a state of degradation, uh, very poorly managed. But um, I uh, put together a land trust fund and in it, we're not allowed to buy land that isn't degraded. And the reason is, is that we know how to regenerate land and we can do it pretty quickly. So why go to as knowledgeable people, why go to the land that already is like pristine or whatever and go in there and start exploiting the resources? Instead, buy up the cheap land. It will grow in value as we uh, improve it. So it becomes an investment opportunity for us also as an alternative to relying on any currency. Um, and that would, uh, we can have a food forest established about seven years. You can have 
um, if you're growing a Christmas tree, um, three to five years before you have abundance of lumber. And uh, with intensive animal grazing, um, approximately three to five years before you've restored, regenerated the soil. So it's all delayed gratification. So instead of us buying, spending a lot of money right now on getting something that's new and perfect, what if we instead use that to buy inexpensive land, invest in the resources we need to regenerate it, and we can also feel good about how we terraform it because we're not going in to this raw land and having to cut down these trees. Instead, we have a blank canvas. And we can build it up to exactly what we want it to become. In some yeah, ways, I think, I think with our skill sets, permaculture ideas, and our, our skill sets, we certainly could take any land and bring it up to, to its uh, full purpose. We, we certainly wouldn't exploit any kind of perfect piece of property. We would want to manage it. We would be managers or stewards of the land and work with Mother Nature. Uh, the, it would be better to have land that maybe hadn't been uh, uh, pesticides, uh, chemicals for years and years, but still it can be done and we would have the skill set to do that. Uh, it would be good to have some type of resources as far as water, but then there's rain. So there are some factors that we would look at, but I agree. Anything with our skill sets and our ideas and understanding of the land, we could certainly bring back to life. Yeah, totally. I'm, I got to admit your, your idea is better than taking a land that's pristine or, you know, or nice. And then, um, you know, working with it, it's a, that's a, a better solution. It is a longer solution, you know, you're, and, and yeah, there is, that is a longer solution and it's a way more convincing though, at the end of the seven years as a model for other people, because you have just like Tamara.org in Portugal started with really dry air, a uh, really dry area. And now they have this nice sized lake there and they're, they're growing all their food so that's that, that's way more impressive than to start with a place that's already well wooded and has water on it you, the 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 curve to get up to sustainability then is um much longer you know you're you're instead of like one to two years you're looking at seven years like you said I think, I think jumping in, oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, I was just gonna say for the people who are watching this at a future date, um, we're talking about sustainability on a piece of property to where eventually we're talking about uh, raising 90 to 95% of our food source. Um, if you dare to challenge yourself and your family or your community to do this, uh, this is this is the frame set that we're coming from. Go ahead. Now, if if you look online for that book, uh, restorative agriculture. There's restorative and there's regenerative. There's two different authors on there. I was trying to do a little research here while I was listening to you guys. Is there a big difference, do you think, between the two, or are they part of the same movement? Are you talking about Mark Shepard versus who? Uh, there's Regenerative Agriculture by Richard Park. Something. Richard Perkins. Well, so there's yeah, re I, Regenerative I, and Restorative. Uh, I didn't know if they were I, on the, I, along I the same lines the or... I would go with the Mark Shepard book. Okay. Shepherd That's just my... Is there, I saw some of his videos are pretty good. Is there an audio book of that for people that don't like to read? Yes. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. But uh, even the two, the, two different, the two different terms you have there is restore and regenerative. And maybe there's a slight difference in that, but it would be interesting to know in their books what they uh, differentiate between the two or how they... Uh, separate between restoring and regenerative? Um, I would say, according to Mark Shepard, they're the same. He termed a restoration agriculture about a decade ago, and regenerative has become the dominant term uh, over the past decade. So he was just ahead of the curve. And I think if you were to read it, it would be regenerative. 
I like in the Mark Shepard's video where he, as he's going through his land, he sees his neighbor's land where they didn't do anything and where he did minimal, but he still shepherded it. Mark Shepard, I guess. He still took care of it and the difference it was between the two. Sorry, Oren, you were going to say something. Yeah, uh, Max, I shouldn't have just laughed. Uh, there is a way to take um, a PDF in Linux and change it into uh, using a text to voice program and so there are such uh, there are solutions out there if there is not an audio book out there already oh that's good to know thank you guys I'm the one hosting this and I've got about five minutes until I need to get on a, uh, a taxi to go to the airport so any closing statements uh, I have a really quick comment to Rogue. Uh, I, I like what you brought up. I was going to bring that up also. Um, in that example, he basically is demonstrating the difference between stewardship and wild and how indigenous people believe that the land needed to be steward and not stewarded and not wild. And um, they, the native uh, people have been pushed off or indigenous people have been pushed off much of the land. And a lot of the land in the, the, US and the world is gone wild as a result of it. Um, so I do think we need to step back into, again, reawaken to our roles as stewards of the land, stewards of forests. Yeah, I, I had a quick question. I was wondering who's going to make it to the, the HEX conventions in March and July here. Are you going to be making it up to that HEX dragon? I'm interested. I don't want to spend the money on the ticket right now. I'm pretty heavily in, <laughs> invested um, it, but I would make the drive for sure if somebody else printed me a ticket and I would pay them back later, but I don't want to spend the money right now. Is the yeah, investment period for that ticket right now the only yeah. ticket they'll have available, or is that just a, uh, are they building up to funding it? Well, I, I know they're, they're, they're trying to sell 1,369 tickets by today, and that's what they're using to put down on, on some of the, um, convention halls and things that they're trying to secure. So I'm not sure if they'll do another round or what after that, but that that's what's going on right now for the ticket sales. So they're having something yeah. that's a fundraiser um, and it's kind of on donation based, understanding that you'll get a ticket later. And so we're on round two right now. Um, I bought at the beginning of round two. I missed round one. Did did the price go up for round two, or what's no. the difference? No, the reason why is because they were accepting crypto, and so they needed to uh, cash that crypto and get it put into fiat. So you stop the process and then restart the process. Cool. Or did we want to do a food what uh, food hex a hex foodies group meet up at the same time down there or do some type of thing? I or figure we'll just, in my opinion, I figure we'll all be just intertwined. So like, let's try to get as many foodies as we can to join. And I'm talking about like people who are looking at their diet and people who are growing food, like everybody. Cool. Well, thanks. Thank you so much for everyone that came to talk, and uh, thanks, thanks, uh, Eco Builder for for hosting and setting this up. All right. Thank. You. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys, con for converging here. It's been awesome. And uh, I'll post this to the Facebook group uh, Hex Foodies. That's the only way I know how right now. And I believe soon I'll get the okay from uh, uh, YouTube to live stream on them and then I'll share all the admin stuff with you guys because we're this is anarchy here. Perfect. Volunteerism. Thank y'all. Yeah. Okay, see y'all. All right. See you guys. Peace.